Hello, everyone. I'm Megan Sullivan, and welcome back to my series, Can a 4X Strategy Noob Survive 100 Turns of Civilization 6? I am hoping to stick the landing tonight. Last time was a little rough, but I think things are going to be a lot better this time. Queen Gorgo, please lead us to victory. So you can see Queen Gorgo here. She is famously the wife of the famous King Leonidas of Thermopylae fame. Uh, but today I'm excited to talk about not Queen Gorgo, not our famous husband, King Leonidas, but a king who is much more influential and interesting than Leonidas, believe it or not. And that is his brother, King Cleomenes the first. And if we have time, we're also going to talk about Leonidas's nephew, the King Regent Pausanias. Both these Aegean princes are super fascinating, and I love talking about uh, their history. Speaking of history, we are trying to um, advance uh, in history. We are in the classical era, but we need to keep moving forward. And one of the ways we should do that is... Um, Learning astrology, I think, which makes sense. The Spartans were hyper-religious. And uh, although it says astrology, astronomy and astrology uh, were two sides of the same coin in ancient times. And I think that's important to recognize. At some point, I should learn mathematics. Uh, math, my nemesis. I don't know how I feel about you. Money's always good. Thinking. <laughs> I don't know, you guys. Uh, yeah, I should probably do astrology. It's probably important. Again, Spartans were super religious. But at any rate, uh, let's talk about King Cleomenes first. He was probably, you know, it's hard to say when he was born. We don't actually know. But we have an idea of when he ascended the Spartan throne. Now, remember, he was one of two kings of Sparta. And Cleomenes was from House Agiad. His father, King Ariston, ooh, look, jade, luxury resource, nifty, rice. None of these things existed around ancient Sparta, by the way. Neither did oranges, although there's a lot of citrus fruit groves in modern Sparta today. But at any rate, sorry, uh, we were talking about King Cleomenes, who ascended the throne in 520 BCE, but not without some uh, contention from his own family. So Cleomenes was one of four sons of King Anaxandridas II of Sparta. So Anaxandridas had four sons. Cleomenes from his second wife and from his first wife, three sons named Dorius, Leonidas, yes, that Leonidas, and Wales, really? Okay. Um, and Cleombrotus, the younger brother of Leonidas or possibly twin. So Cleomenes, Dorius, Leonidas, and Cleombrotus. Um, what's strange is that Anaxandridas' first wife, which was also his niece, initially didn't have any sons by Anaxandridas. They went for years without having any children, which is why the Spartan state pressured King Anaxandridas to take a second wife. The second wife ended up having a son, Cleomenes, but then, weirdly enough, the first wife suddenly started producing sons of her own, which were Dorius, Leonidas, and Cleombrotus. So this is kind of awkward now. Uh, Anaxandridas had uh, too many heirs. And when he died in 520 BCE, there was a fight for the throne between Cleomenes, the eldest son of his second wife, and just his eldest son overall, and, um, and the eldest son, Dorius, from Anaxandridas' first wife and queen. And the reason why Dorius felt like he had a shot at the throne was because although he was younger than Cleomenes, he was the eldest son of the first wife and queen. Also, he had survived the Agoge, which was a very rigorous and brutal military academy that all boys were required to attend from ages 7 to 20 in ancient Sparta. So, ooh, political philosophy. Government unlocked. Uh, thinking? Classic. Yes. You know what? Oligarchy. This makes sense. So Sparta was weird. It had three branches of government, executive, which was like the two kings, and then a judicial branch, which was a garosia, and then kind of a legislative branch. It's, it's hard to explain, but then they had the ephors, uh, which was kind of like a senate. I don't know. It's, it's, <laughs> it's not really an exact one-to-one, -one, but at any rate, definitely an oligarchy makes sense for ancient Sparta. So it was sort of partially an oligarchy. 
the legislative and executive and judicial branches were mostly made up of rich, powerful men, so it checks out. But at any rate, uh, when it came to the executive branch, there was a fight between Dorius and Cleomenes. And uh, so there's the Agoge, which is what Dorius survived. Um, it was this brutal, uh, you know, military academy for young men. And men would, you know, these young boys would die. It was so brutal. It was a really brutal, harsh upbringing. Um, and so Dorius not only survived it, he thrived. God, king. Again, Spartans are religious. Um, and um, Dorius is like, you know, I survived the Agoge. I'm the eldest son of the first queen and wife of Anaxandridas. Oh, and by the way, I'm not crazy like Cleomenes is. And so Herodotus reports that Cleomenes was not quite right in the head. We don't know what that means. We don't know what kind of mental illness he had, if he even had any sort of my mental illness. This could have been political propaganda against Cleomenes because he was extremely powerful and ambitious. We just don't know. But Dorius used that fact against Cleomenes. Um, and... So the Spartans they were all strong arguments, so Dorius definitely had his fanboys, but ultimately the state was like, you know what, we don't want to set a weird precedent where every time a new king comes to the throne, there's a fight for that throne. So we're going to let the eldest take the throne, claim that his wins. And, um, yeah, I'm going to put maritime industries. No, Sparta was not known for their navy. They were a land army, but they do need a ship or two uh, because they're right by the ocean. As you can see, you know, technically Sparta was actually about 27 miles away from the ocean. But, you know, close enough for government work. Here we go. Hey, look, hanging gardens. This has nothing to do with ancient Sparta and everything to do with ancient Mesopotamia. But I'm liking the style. This is kind of what this is kind of cool to watch. Nifty. Okay, so anyway, sorry. I'm easily distracted, but this is really cool. Hanging gardens. Awesome. Good job, Queen Gorgo. Uh, so at any rate, um, Cleomenes wins the throne and Dorius is mad. He flounces off like a diva. He tries to start a colony uh, in Libya, in North Africa, but that doesn't work. So he tries to start a colony in Sicily and that doesn't work and he gets killed by the locals. Thus ends the tale of Prince Dorius. However, um, Cleomenes does have two younger brothers who will come into the picture, which is, uh, or sorry, which are uh, Leonidas and Cleombrotos. And we're going to take on this barbarian archer here. The word barbarian actually comes from the Greek bar, 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 uh, which is what foreign languages sounded like to the Greeks. So anyone who didn't speak Greek was a barbarian. That's where we get that from. Hey, we learned astrology. Sweet. Cool. Nifty. Also, I feel like I have been neglecting Argos. To be fair, that's very Spartan. Argos was a traditional rival and enemy of Sparta. In fact, Sparta's Peloponnesian League, which was Sparta and their allies, um, all got started because even though Sparta was not popular with their neighbors, um, the least popular city-state in the Peloponnese, southern Greece, was Argos. So Sparta was able to make a lot of friends because the, f the enemy of my enemy is my friend, right? So <laughs> that's how the Peloponnesian League got started. And it was started under King Anaxandridas, but it really expanded under King Cleomenes. Once he became king, um, he sort of bullied his allies into, uh, you know, marching along with him. Um, but he also was in charge of a lot of negotiations as well. Like Sparta's reputation for being a powerful military spread far and wide. And in fact, um, people from, as, from places as far as like Scythia, the island of Samos, the Aegean Sea would all come and ask Cleomenes to help them with their local disputes. And often Cleomenes had to be practical and be like, no, you guys are too far away. Um, that's not going to work. Uh, the truth is Sparta didn't like going too far from home because their slaves outnumbered them by a lot. Um, and so Cleomenes didn't like going too far from home, but he had no problems interfering with his neighbors, including Athens. So around 514, between 514 and 510 BCE, um, and it depends on whether you believe Thucydides' version of events or Herodotus' version of events, but either the tyrant of Athens or the brother of the tyrant of Athens is murdered. And this um, causes a civil war in Athens. 
And it's the family of the tyrant versus everyone who doesn't like the tyranny, including a powerful family led by a man named Cleisthenes. Now, Cleisthenes manages to bribe the powerful oracle at Delphi into telling the Spartans over and over again to help Athens in their civil war and get rid of the tyranny, even though the tyrants are sort of allies, friends of the Spartans. Um, but Cleomenes not only hears this, you know, uh, holy command, uh, but also sees an opportunity. Like, if I help Athens in their civil war and I get rid of the tyranny, they'll be indebted to me and they can join the Peloponnesian League and I can add them to my collection of allies and uh, basically rule over all of Greece as a sort of de facto leader of this alliance, right? Like a hegemon. So Cleomenes agrees and he takes a small army to Athens and kicks out uh, the family of tyrants. Um, but as soon as he leaves, there's a fight between Cleisthenes and another man, Isagoras, who is going to fill this power vacuum. And uh, what, uh, what new civic skill do I need to learn since we're doing this civics lesson? Uh, Da, 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 drama and poetry, political philosophy, recorded history, defensive tactics, military training really jives with the Spartans. So I feel like I should do that. Uh, 30 production towards encampment districts. Do I even want to bother with that though? Oh, words one envoy. Uh, thinking, thinking. Sorry, it's hard to give a history lesson and concentrate on the game. Uh, still learning how to do this. And we're on turn 82 and things are not going too bad, by the way. So that's, that's good. Great library. Ooh. Theology. Again, the Spartans are very religious. Thinking, 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 thinking. Uh, naval tradition. Yeah, that's Athens. <laughs> um, sorry, if you're playing as the Spartans, you automatically have to boo the Athenians. It's like the law or something. <laughs> Games and recreations. Oh, even the Spartans need to unwind every once in a while. Coliseum, not really a Spartan thing. Entertainment complex, also not really a Spartan thing, but it gives a lot of culture, so we're going to go for it. Okay, because we do want to try to win the game uh, by spreading culture. And the great thing is Sparta can spread culture by punching barbarians in the face and also building all sorts of monuments and whatnot. 290 culture. Huh. Huh, 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 huh. Thinking... Professional army. Yeah, professional army would also be good. Okay, so at any rate, uh, Cleomenes uh, helps the Athenians get rid of their tyrants, but there is a power vacuum between Cleisthenes, a powerful leader of a noble family in Athens, and a man named Isagoras. Now, Cleisthenes gets the one up on um, Isagoras by promising the common folk that if they back him in this power struggle, he will expand their powers greatly. Ex sorry. City-state Toronto? <laughs> Does Justin Trudeau know that Toronto is a city-state? <laughs> uh, what are the bonuses I can earn? Like, where should I, where should I send an envoy? I've been neglecting my envoys, and that's been a problem, and I really want to rectify it. Even Sparta had to have friends. That's their Peloponnesian League. Um, do, 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 do. Maybe thinking. All right. Well, anyway, while I think about this, I wanted to tell you guys about the power struggle between Cleisthenes and Isagoras. Cleisthenes promises to expand people power, so they back him in the fight against Isagoras. And Isagoras, being more traditional noble, is all upset, and he actually asks Cleomenes, King Cleomenes of Sparta, to come back and help him. Help me defeat these commoners. How dare they? And Cleomenes could have been like, no, dude, I already, I already helped you. You said get rid of the tyrants, and I did that. But he saw, again, an opportunity to interfere in Athenian politics and make Sparta even more powerful. Maybe Athens will be a puppet uh, state to Sparta, and their leader has to do everything I say if he's indebted to me. So Cleomenes marches a very small army, basically his bodyguard of 300 or whatever, he goes to, um, he goes back to Athens. You know what? Should I send an envoy to this city state? I feel like I should we get some culture points in here, right? We can, uh, we can make them our, uh, you know, our 
subservient to Sparta. Um, and that's what Cleomenes wants to do. So he helps the Agoras. He sends a small army to Athens to kick Cleisthenes and his supporters out. But the common people rise up against Isagoras and Cleomenes, and Cleomenes gets drop kicked out of Athens. And he's mad about it. So he raises a bigger army, and he gets the Peloponnesians to back him up on this, and he marches to Athens, intending to crush them. And they have to do whatever he says, right? Like, if he wants an oligarchy or whatever in Athens, they're going to do it, because Cleomenes said so. And we actually have some nice farmland going in Argos. Argos has been really neglected in this game, and so I really want to fix that. Uh, and boy, is Argos historically going to get it from Sparta pretty soon. Um, but first, Athens. So Cleomenes marches to Athens with his Peloponnesian allies. But the allies are like, you know what? We get the sense that this is a petty personal feud now. Like, why are we interfering in Athenian politics? It's their business. So the Peloponnesians turn around and go home. And the co-king of Cleomenes Demaratus is also like, you know what? This whole thing is ridiculous. I'm going home too. So he takes his whole half of the Spartan army and he goes home. And now Cleomenes is, is totally humiliated, can't go on his vengeance spree, and has to turn around and go home. And he's so mad at Demaratus for betraying him, he engineers King Demaratus' downfall. Um, and Cleomenes is not done yet. He does a lot of controversial things in his kingship, including this. So around, f I want to say, 494 BCE. He picks a fight with Argos, and Argos and Sparta go to war. And they end up in this battle, and Sparta wins the battle. And the Argive soldiers, realizing that they've lost, go claim sanctuary in a sacred grove. Now, a sacred grove is like a sanctuary, right? Like, like you can't go in it. Your enemies can't touch you there. It's against cosmic law, right? It's, it's like, you know, when someone takes refuge in a church, they're supposed to be safe. Cleomenes does not care. He knows that the Argive soldiers think they're safe in the grove and they're not going to come out because they think it's a safe space. And so what does Cleomenes do? He burns down the entire sacred grove, which is super evil of him and wrong. I mean, it's just wrong. And this, you know, story gets all over the Greek world, right? So now Cleomenes has a terrifying, terrible reputation, right? And this act, and it's just one of one or two sacrilegious acts that he that he does. He also destroys some territory uh, in a sacred area near Athens. He whips um, priests of the goddess Hera when he's trying to give thanksgiving for winning against Argos in a battle. Like this, Cleomenes is definitely unorthodox, and he is only religious when it seems to suit him. Right. Now, of course, we have to take the word of Herodotus for a lot of this, right? We don't know how much of this is really historical and which is just hearsay that Herodotus feels obliged to report. Um, but it's consistent enough, so it wouldn't be too surprising, right? Like, whether he was crazy or just crazy ambitious, we don't know. But Cleomenes certainly earned a reputation. And finally, the machinations, you know, against Demaratus and his unorthodox way of fighting and dragging his allies everywhere, it finally all catches up to him, and the Spartan state is basically ready to put him on trial. So Cleomenes runs. He runs from Sparta, and according to Herodotus, he may have been gathering an army against Sparta itself, whether either with, you know, you know, working with the slaves at Sparta or working with, you know, Peloponnesian allies who are not the biggest fans of Sparta. I'm not totally clear on that. But he's going to march on Sparta, and the Spartans panic, and they try to bring Cleomenes home. And so Cleomenes is lured home, and his brothers throw him in the stocks. No joke, they throw him in the stocks, basically for acting like a crazy person. Because apparently, according to Herodotus, Cleomenes comes home. Eureka! Knowledge boost. Okay, great. Sorry, <laughs> it was a weird, that was a weird interruption, but that appeared on my screen. I'm like, okay, I'm still playing this game here. Uh, I'm still trying to concentrate on the game, but also give a history lesson. But at any rate, Cleomenes is put in the stocks, right, uh, by his family. And here's where things quite literally get dicey. Um, because Herodotus claims that Cleomenes committed suicide. That while he was locked up, he asked a slave to free him and give him a knife. Which is very unlikely that the slave would ever think to do that. But that's what Herodotus says. And then 
Cleomenes is supposedly so crazy, he basically commits harakiri and cuts himself up from feet to belly and dies of his injuries. Which is very unlikely. I'm going to give this guy a volley. Uh, send envoy. Uh, I want to send another envoy. We're, we're getting better at this envoy thing, right? We're, we're making friends, right? We've got our own little, uh, if not a Peloponnesian alliance, right? Then we've got a, a very eclectic alliance going on. Okay, but at any rate. So, Cleomenes dies. And uh, weirdly, different people have different explanations. The Spartans have the weirdest explanation of all. They claim that he got drunk and killed himself. Like, he went crazy from drinking too much wine. Which, I don't know, maybe there's some bacteria in it that, uh, that messed with him. But it's unlikely that that happened. It's more likely. And then the, the, uh, Argi the Argives and the... Um, the Athenians, they claim that this was divine punishment for, you know, defying the gods or uh, being blasphemous and burning down sacred groves and whipping priests and whatnot. So everyone thinks that this is divine punishment, right? Um, but the truth is, most scholars think that Cleomenes was murdered, and it's very likely he was murdered by king, the future King Leonidas and or his brother Cleombrotos, right? Cleomenes was now a liability to Sparta. He had to get out of the way. So it is very likely that he was murdered. Um, and then King Leonidas, around 490 BCE, takes the throne and possibly to shore up his power, right? To ensure that nobody doubts that he's supposed to be king, right? He wants to shore up his power. This might be about when he marries Queen Gorgo. Why? Because Gorgo is Cleomenes' only child. Cleomenes only has a daughter. And that is where Gorgo comes into play. So although... Gorgo is, you know, later historians put a lot of quips and things into Gorgo's mouth. And it's likely that Spartan women were just as laconic as their husbands and brothers and, you know, you know, cousins, male cousins and whatnot, right? Um, but um, it's not really clear if Gorgo said any of these things, but these witticisms uh, that are attributed to her are pretty funny. And that's why so she sort of makes it into Civilization VI, right? Very strong, independent Spartan women. Uh, were fascinating to ancient historians and even modern historians. All right, so it's really cool to see Queen Gorgo here. Uh, but it's most likely she had no choice but to marry her uncle Leonidas, and she gives him one son, right? So she gives him an heir. Um, and uh, unfortunately, that heir does not live to be king. We don't know when he dies or exactly how he dies, but... That son disappears from history. He's only mentioned once very briefly in Thucydides. Um, but if Leonidas dies, what happens? Who becomes king? Well, at this point, Leonidas' very young son is still alive. So his twin or younger brother... Hey, games and recreation. Cool. Yeah. Neato. Um, Cleombrotos. Prince Cleombrotos takes over. But here's the wild thing. Uh, Cleombrotos dies within a year of Leonidas. And so it's up to Cleombrotus' eldest son, Pausanias, to take over. And Pausanias is a super fascinating character. Um, he has a string of spectacular victories over the invading Persians. Um, and Tomaris um, of the Scythian Empire would know all about that. She is the one who defeated the very first um, Persian king, Cyrus the Great, famously. That's why she is in this game, right? So Gorgo and her are friends. You can actually see at the very top, there's a smiley face next to the queen um, because she and Gorgo naturally get along. They Neither of them like the Persians, and they're both powerful warrior women. That's awesome. I love it. Uh, and we're doing okay against these barbarians. We might make it to turn 100. Yes, our two nations have never been stronger. May you have many victories in times of peace. Girl, high five. You're cool. I love it. I love it. We're going to be besties. Okay. But at any rate, um, so Pausanias takes over after Leonidas. So Leonidas, blah, 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 sorry, Leonidas uh, dies at the Battle of Thermopylae, right? Um, and then a year later, there is a spectacular land victory over the Persian army at the Battle of Plataea. Um, and the one leading the charge was... Uh, King Regent Pausanias of Sparta, 
who won despite the craziest odds, right? The Persians outnumbered him. There was squabbling in the Greek camp. There was squabbling within the Spartan camp. Um, the Spartans and their allies had to keep switching positions against the Persians to try to find the most advantageous place to fight the Persians because the Persians were not going to fight by usual Greek phalanx rules, right? So this is all uncharted territory. And yet this very young Spartan region who may have been leading the Greek alliance, you know, and he was only possibly as young as like, you know, 25, right? Like this really pretty young kid. Um, he manages to pull off a spectacular victory. And that's not his only victory. A lot of people don't know this. Even if they know the Battle of Plataea, they may not know that Pausanias had three more victories over the Persians and their allies. So just 11 days, basically about 11 days after Plataea, Pausanias marches the Greek alliance against Thebes. Thebes is a city-state that had no choice but to capitulate to the Persians and be on their side. It didn't matter. Pausanias didn't care. He wanted to get rid of Thebes as a threat and defeats them in a siege. They capitulate and Pausanias um, hangs most of the leaders of Thebes for uh, their part in the Persian War when they are on the wrong side and um, he may have felt that they pay, played a part in his famous uncle King Leonidas's death. Um, so he gets his vengeance, basically. And then a year later, Pausanias has a spectacular win against the Persians at, on the island of Cyprus, and then again at uh, Byzantium, which later becomes Constantinople, which later becomes Istanbul, not Constantinople. You get the idea. So Pausanias has a string of spectacular victories. And he wants to continue his aggressive policy against Persia, but also against the Athenians. Sparta and Athens are starting to butt heads over who's in charge. Is it the Athenian navy or is it the Spartan army? Who is in charge of the Greek alliance? And there's a falling out. And Pausanias may have been part of a group of hawks that wanted to take on Persia and or Athens um, in Ionia, which is the west coast of Turkey where the Greeks were trying to throw out the Persians. You're back. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to settle too close to you. I still want to be Vestes. Sorry, but we've got a Festus now. We've got a new colony and I want to, I want to keep expanding. But at any rate, um, so Pausanias has a more aggressive policy against Athens and the Persians and the Athenians don't like it and neither do a particular faction of Spartans. And so the two, Athens and this rival faction in Sparta, start working against Pausanias. They accuse him of being very arrogant. Um, they start kicking up rumors that he actually wants to work with Persia and he's going to betray the Greek alliance. Uh, and there's even a trial or two held against Pausanias about, you know, like, hey, are you on the Persian side? Are you, are you being unorthodox like King Cleomenes? But Pausanias is continuously found innocent. He's like, I'm not doing anything wrong. Right, And it could be that some of Pausanias' policies were actually instigated by the Spartan state, but they were secret. They couldn't let the Athenians know that they were trying to undermine the Athenians, which might also include secretly negotiating a separate peace treaty with, um, with Persia. So in the end, Pausanias is straight up murdered by the Spartans. They throw a bunch of accusations about him that are suspicious. Oh, you're working to have a slave revolt or you're working with Persia, even though there's no evidence. And Pausanias keeps being found innocent until one day he comes home and he realizes that he's going to go to prison and he's probably not coming out alive. So he goes and he finds sanctuary at a temple of Athena in Sparta. And the Spartans basically brick him up in the temple and leave him to starve to death. They pull his body out just before he starves to death so it doesn't pollute the temple. But Pausanias dies. Um, but his ghost is very vengeful and um, starts wreaking havoc in Sparta. So they go to the Oracle of Delphi who takes them to task and is like, you basically murdered this poor soldier. You owe him a couple of statues, a memorial, and a lot of prayers. And so a hero cult is established to Pausanias in the hopes of placating his ghost. I actually talk about it when I talk about the real ghost of Sparta in my History and Games episode on Kratos and the god of the real god of war, or sorry, the real ghost of Sparta, which has to do with the god of war series and Kratos. Um, so if I remember to put this in post, uh, go ahead and check out that video. 
it's really interesting. But those are the two most interesting people in Sparta, Pausanias, the king regent, and King Cleomenes. Um, I just really, really wanted to talk about them. And I'm sorry I didn't talk much about uh, my play style here uh, today, but it's actually been going pretty well. I've been better about getting ships. I've been better about getting envoys out. I've been expanding Spartan territory, right? Like doing all the things that the fifth century Spartans were doing to expand their power. Now we haven't had time to talk about the Peloponnesian War or the downfall of Sparta at the hands of, and I just brought them up earlier, the city-state of Thebes. Um, you know, Pausanias gets his revenge on Thebes, but Thebes will eventually tag Sparta back in a spectacular way in the fourth century. Unfortunately, we don't have time to cover that here, but if you want me to continue this series past the 100 turns, past surviving 100 terms, uh, turns, let me know. I would be super glad to do so. I've really enjoyed playing this game. Um, I'm happy to do whatever you guys want as long as we can play games and talk history. So with that said, if you enjoyed this, leave a comment in the comment section below and be sure to like and follow this channel and I'll see you guys later.